So hello everybody and welcome to today's uh, webinar from NBS. It's another one in our webinar series looking at the RIBA Plan of Work 2020. And today we're looking at sustainable outcomes and the RIBA Plan of Work 2020. So a little bit of housekeeping beforehand. Uh, the webinar should last between about 45 and 60 minutes. Everybody attending today has got their microphones muted, but you can feed back to us, ask questions uh, using uh, the little uh, question box, which is on your screen. And if you do want to join the conversation on Twitter as we go, there's a little hashtag there, hashtag NBS webinar, and uh, feel free to sort of post on social media as well. So uh, just to introduce myself, my name's Stephen Hamill. I'm Innovation Director here at NBS. Uh, joining me today, we have uh, Gary Clark, who's Regional Leader of Science and Technology at HOK. And we've also got my colleague at MBS, Michelle, who's Technical Content Quality Assurance Manager. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to start with a presentation from uh, Gary Clark, uh, looking at sustainable outcomes and the RIBA Plan of Work 2020. Then we'll move on to a presentation from Michelle, looking at specifying sustainable outcomes. And then we'll finish with myself, and uh, I'll uh, throw a few questions at Gary and Michelle and do a little bit of a roundup. So enough from me, let's hand over now to Gary. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, name's Gary Clark. Uh, I'm uh, Regional Director at uh, HOK, but also uh, I chair the RIB Sustainable Futures Group. Um, what I'll be presenting today is actually the, uh, the work of the RIB Sustainable Futures Group, uh, looking at how the uh, we embed uh, this, the uh, sustainable outcomes into the plan of work. So just a few slides in terms of introduction and then we'll go through each of the outcomes in turn. First one is really a recap of where we are uh, and this is actually the root of the problem uh, is we've got 7.7 .7 billion people and rising fast uh, which collectively uh, last year emitted 37 billion tons of CO2. A third of this in the world is from con buildings construction. Uh, but the earth can only absorb half this uh, amount and this is causing obviously the core core impact in terms of climate change. Um, as we see in COVID, uh, the impacts of this is the healthy planet and the healthy people actually are interrelated with profit. So we've got to balance up profit with what the health can support and what planet can support as well. So that's that's the whole aim of a sustainable outcome. The UN uh, and the IPCC have uh, uh, issued guidance last year, which really shows the, the emissions gap in terms of what we need to do and how fast we need to go. And the result of this is uh, we're on a four degree trajectory. Uh, I think there's some debate in terms of that, but I, I, I believe we are four degrees increase for the, the 2100. And we need to get uh, down to the two degree uh, range there. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to get to the 1.5, but we need to get to that two degree. The Committee of Climate Change in the UK, this is their uh, trajectory for the UK. The dark uh, line is what we've done to date, which has actually been not bad, but that's uh, with actually switching off coal power, uh, power stations and converting to gas. And we can see the line there. The dotted line was, uh, uh, was a couple of years ago and the red line is our commitment to net zero by 2050. So it's a big challenge in terms of uh, what we're trying to do now. And the RBA uh, last year declared a climate emergency along with many other organizations. And at the same time, we were actually writing new guidance for the RBA, so the two went hand in hand. The net result of that is last year, we published the 2030 Climate Challenge, uh, which we'll talk about uh, briefly, and also the Sustainable Outcomes Guide as well. And uh, the revised plan of work 2020 was uh, released just before the shutdown and uh, with a sustainable overlay and quite soon we're going to be publishing a new RBA plan for use. We're trying to make sure that uh, the RBA uh, works together with all the other organisations and, and the guys were all uh, linked together behind the scenes with UKGBC and Letty uh, for example and also SIPSI as well. Uh, so we're trying to align uh, and speak with one voice. So what is a net zero carbon development? Um, for us, and this is going into the detail here, but very briefly, it's, it's everything. Um, you can't just pick and choose uh, operation, regulated versus unregulated energy. You've got to consider everything, cradle to grave and cradle to cradle as well, uh, how you're gonna rebuild, rebuild and reuse your buildings. There's a whole range of uh, methods to, to predict this, uh, but the key thing here is that we're moving to uh, good accuracy, which is actually, uh, we need to design for performance. So we need to measure and verify everything we do. Um, this is the kind of timeline of uh, the 2030 challenge. If we do nothing, 
then we're at four degrees. That's the top line right right through that. Uh, and But everybody's kind of signed up to, which is very positive in the UK, um, the 2050 net zero target, which hopefully will we'll get to around about two degrees uh, increase in global temperature, if we all did that, of course. Uh, but really what we're saying at the RBA is uh, in terms of new and deep retrofit buildings, uh, we need to hit a 20, 2030 target for net zero uh, for all those new buildings because uh, the elephant in the room is the 45 million existing buildings um, that is actually contributing uh, that 40% of our carbon emissions in the UK. This is a summary of the uh, the domestic targets. Um, what we've done here is that we're just kind of taking current benchmarks. We've got off-gem for domestic uh, operational energy use. And then what we're saying is 2020, we're reducing that by about 20%. It's a soft start. At 2025, then it's a 50% reduction. And at 2030, uh, we're saying we've got to get into a zone of about 70% reduction for on-site. And then you're then if you get to that point, then you can offset uh, with um, off-site renewables. So that's the operational side of things. Embodied, we're using uh, benchmarks from the uh, 1990s or late, late uh, early 2000s, uh, Movement for Innovation. And again, same thing there. We've, we've done quite a quick uh, uh, reduction in terms of 2020 because things have moved on a bit and construction is actually um, a little bit more efficient. Uh, and then we're really aiming to then reduce again uh, down that sort of 50% reduction at this time by 2030 for embodied carbon targets. Uh, there's a group that's working together, uh, really refining these targets, um, but it's based on uh, RICS. It's a whole life carbon and it's categories A to C. Uh, but we must um, remember that we can't increase or, or create unintended consequences. So this is why we're ensuring that there's going to uh, best practice health metrics uh, we've got to hit. So in terms of overheating, daylighting and so forth, uh, CO2 levels. So that's the domestic targets. Uh, the same thing repeats with non-domestic buildings. And again, the benchmarks are slightly different. We're using SIBC uh, benchmarks for operational energy. And right round about the average uh, office building and, and university building is about 225 kilowatt hours per square meter. And the same thing there, we're reducing down to 70% or 55 kilowatt hours uh, by 2030, which is a decade rating. And similar to the embodied carbon, 50% reduction, and also the water use, uh, we're really trying to get to 40% reduction uh, with those things. So that's the 2030 challenge, but really all the Sustainable Outcomes Guide is all based on uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals. It aligns with all 17, but what we've looked at is, um, is rather than using all 17, which behind that is about 300 metrics, uh, we reduced it down to um, looking at 10, which is then wholly linked to what happens on a site, on a project site. Um, we believe it's an institution level uh, and a government and city level that has got to deal with all 17. Uh, then we've then re further refined that down from 10 through to eight sustainable outcomes. So I'm just going to go through each outcome briefly. First one is net zero operational carbon. It's measured in kilowatt hours per square meter first. Um, uh, you've got to measure energy first before you convert to carbon because the, the grid is decarbonizing. So we've got to be absolutely clear about the efficiency for the building first. Now there's no shortage of energy hitting the earth. Uh, it's, it's one kilowatt hour per square meter for the surface of the planet from the sun. But the problem is how do we harness it and how do we store it? So the first thing really in terms of operational carbon is we've got to think about retrofitting first. Uh, and again, at that elephant in the room, uh, we talk about fabric first approach as well, using the building, the envelope of the building doing most of the work. We talk about regenerative engineering, which is kind of high efficiency, um, high thermal recovery, uh, for instance, is, is one, one uh, strategy. Uh, then we then consider on-site renewables and trying to max out that uh, within sort of a, a, a conventional and, and a sensible and reasonable approach on site. And once you've done all those things, then we say you're allowed to kind of then off-site uh, renewables to hit your net zero carbon. And that's operational carbon. But that's only one half of the story. Uh, we've also, uh, the second outcome is net zero embodied carbon. And again, we, we've used the measure, which is kilogram CO2 uh, per square meter. And this is again, the RICS approach. Uh, now this is, uh, this is key. This is the together with the operational and the embodied, that's the whole life carbon, which is absolutely our target. We must get to that together. Um, the key strategies here is obviously retrofit first uh, is absolutely critical. Uh, then we've got to consider a whole life carbon analysis, making sure that whatever we do is going to pay back its carbon within its uh, well within its lifespan. And we've got to look for local low embodied carbon materials, healthy and ethical materials, 
and we've got to consider offsite uh, uh, um, offsite um, and offsetting as well uh, from renewables. And the the image behind um, is quite interesting. The, the the old temples in Japan they, they were rebuilt every 20 years. I think some of them are still are. Um, and that's that beauty of using local materials from the forest uh, and actually designing for disassembly, where you design and you keep that kind of uh, crafts alive. So I'm not suggesting that we're going to rebuild all our buildings every 20 years, but but really that that thing about retrofit and planning in a retrofit is absolutely critical. Next outcome is sustainable water cycle and it's litres per person per year of potable water. Um, what we're trying to do here is, is, is reduce that potable water use um, as much as we can. So it's low flow of appliances, leak detection, and we really do that by increasing rainwater recycling and attenuation. And we get a double benefit. A, we're reducing potable water. Uh, we use um, rainwater perhaps for flushing loos, uh, for uh, washing machines and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, we're actually adding to the storage capacity of our cities, uh, which has helped to attenuate and creating sustainable urban drainage. And then whatever we do is we're trying to express uh, the natural water flow by creating natural aquatic habitats as well. Next one is uh, sustainable con conductivity and transport. And I think this is absolutely uh, very key and very apt uh, for our current remote working. And it really shows um, really, I think that, um, do we have to travel as much? Um, that's a key thing. We can still do our business. I'm remote working for, uh, and our businesses is, is, is actually working really well. Um, so that's it really is we can have an amazing effect with conductivity. And that was the whole point here is making sure we've got high quality uh, conductivity for everybody uh, and really choosing the times when we actually go and meet people um, face to face. So if we do, then obviously the green transport plan is very much part of that and also linked with a digital plan. The proximity to public transport is absolutely critical. Uh, high quality pedestrian links uh, and then end of journey uh, and the cycle provision. I think you can see the image behind there is the uh, Copenhagen. Notice everybody's uh, wearing no helmets. It's a very safe, segregated path and it should be replicated in the UK. And finally, we've got to think about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles by themselves will not solve this problem. As we see, we've got to really have a step change and only at the end, we've got to think about electric vehicles. Next one is looked at the balance of land use and ecology. Uh, and again, the, the main metric here is again, the, the species uh, added to uh, each site. What we're saying is actually each site, uh, we've got to leave the site with a better ecology than we, than we first discovered it and we first had it. So really looking to retrofit again, brownfield sites, we've got to dramatically increase uh, green cover, especially in urban situations and linking to the London plan, which it's urban green cover uh, metric is very key. We've got to increase biodiversity uh, really significantly uh, going forward. And then the productive food landscape and we see the kids there this thing about um, decentralizing uh, some of our food we, we can't grow all our food in cities but it really helps to to minimize that um, and, and provides resilience as well especially uh, as we see in this uh, this this crisis in terms of covid and really good health and well-being uh, moving into that. So that's the outside of the buildings and this is coming more inside. But the key, the key thing there is, is the Rathbone Square. It's actually about contact outside. And I think as we've seen in, in uh, during the current COVID, the, it's so precious, it's so important to any green space. Uh, and, and we're designing cities where no one has access to green space. Uh, um, and luckily I live in a, uh, a Victorian uh, neighbourhood uh, with parks around that and I'm enjoying rediscovering my, my local neighbourhood. So we've got to consider how we design cities in the future like that. We've got to ensure that that kind of contact outside. So contacts outside, contact by Philia. We've got to think about our density of our, our spaces. And then really this is, this is so apt just now in terms of uh, the current lockdown. Indoor air quality is absolutely critical. Good uh, lighting, adaptive thermal comfort good acoustics, and then really this uh, inclusive and approach to circulation uh, and active circulation in terms of uh, health and well-being. Moving into sustainable communities and social values. Now, what this is trying to do or to say is it isn't just about building. We're creating a community. We're creating something greater than uh, than the buildings themselves. It's the places in between. And uh, this is Granary Square in King's Cross, a fantastic place. One of the best new squares, I think, in London for, for, for many, many years. And the impact of this is really it's, it's a, a mixed use and a tenure. It's, it's creating identity and territories and spaces. It's creating secure places. It's creating social places and amenities for the public. It's permeability, high quality links and inclusive community places. And the social value of this is what we should be starting to thinking about. 
And the final sort of outcome is sustainable life cycle cost. So really, it's trying to link all these together. And then Earthrise is chosen because we've only got one planet. So we must um, live within its means. Uh, we've got to live within its interest rather than actually taking its capital. And these are the kind of key things. We've got to balance the whole life cycle cost of what we're trying to do. But the benefits are great. We can save energy. We know that. We can actually save material costs in terms of whole life carbon. We can save operational costs, but we can add the value uh, in terms of health and well-being and also social value. So all those go together in terms of the circle. Now, what we use, this is ICON. Uh, this is actually then integrated into the new plan of work. It's absolutely embedded. We wrote it all at the same time. And uh, the key thing there, if I just... Um, Go into this slide this is uh, absolutely uh, spend a moment on this so we can see the new uh, rb stages the, the in terms of the only change at the top was uh, stage three which is now called spatial coordination trying to emphasize a point that the building may be especially coordinated but it's not technically coordinated until we do uh, stage four uh, stage five is updated to manufacturing and construction because a lot of this will be off-site hopefully in the future and then really uh, linking through uh, from the other side uh, is all the outcomes are at the left hand side of the, of the slide. And what we do is we track, we track these outcomes throughout the design process. So you set these uh, outcomes with your client uh, and with your community or whatever, your design team uh, at the beginning of the process in terms of stage one. Then you integrate these into the early concept in terms of strategies. And then you've got to monitor, review, reality check them through uh, stages three and four, hand over to the contractor, and then you've got to then validate what the contractor is doing in terms of is he, uh, is, is, uh, are they kind of sort of achieving these outcomes? And then uh, disseminating in terms of handing that over to the, uh, the client and the user. And the key point here is, is actually stage six is the defects period. At the end of stage six, uh, we're actually asking people to do a post occupancy evaluation, a light touch. POE. And then finally, in stage seven, uh, it's improving those outcomes, or, or at least proving them. And we can see there, this is the, the stage there. So just a moment on this one. This is the new plan of use, which we published quite soon from uh, the RBA. And really what we're saying here is the graduated post occupancy evaluation, light church review at the end of stage six. This is best practice. Very simple um, strategies. It's not involved, but it makes amazing difference. And then you gradually go into greater detail and you only need to do it when, uh, when the needs must. So you go into year two would be a diagnostic assessment using tools. And then if um, there's certain persistent issues, then you look at a detailed forensic investigation. And this is how the uh, the plan of use and, and sustainability is, is marked out. These are the kind of strategies, and this is how it's uh, linked within the actual uh, plan, uh, the plan of work document. And we see how it's all linked there. And then this is the final page. This is kind of a summary page of say stage zero. So this is repeated throughout everything. But notice in the center there, the outcomes are front and center uh, of each stage of the plan of work now. And this is the end one in terms of use. So we can see it's 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 right the way through. It's, it's a golden thread right the way through the plan of work. So can we achieve all these outcomes and uh, can we hit net zero? Uh, that's a big question. I'm sure you're all thinking that <laughs> listening to me. Um, but the answer we believe is we can. And uh, last year I was judge of the uh, 2019 Sterling Prize. And uh, we gave it, it was, a, you know, it was a very clear winner for, from, from my perspective. It's Goldsmith Street in Norwich. And when we analyzed the, uh, the, the sustainability criteria, it actually hit uh, our 2030 targets. Uh, so we can see there are 90% reduction in, um, in uh, energy, but that's with no renewables. Okay, so this is absolutely through passive house uh, principles. And the embodied carbon uh, 336, that's almost came very close to our 2030 target. And, and it's a very kind of conventional uh, construction as well. So really exciting that one. Then moving into uh, another example of passive ice. This is a net positive passive ice building. It's a few years old now, but it really shows if you add passive ice principles plus PV, um, then you get into a net positive building. This is uh, this is actually uh, generating enough electricity to power that electric car for a year. So very good, very interesting story. But then moving up a scale, perfect complexity. This is. Um, Enterprise Centre at uh, University of East Anglia. Fantastic building. And again, that hits our, uh, it gets into the sweet spot of the 2030 challenge, 70% reduction without uh, PVs. So that's ex extremely amazing uh, performance there. Then going up to another scale, uh, this is actually Keensham Town Hall. Uh, and again, a very complex building. Uh, it's done well. It hasn't hit exactly our 2030 challenge, but it just shows it's very close. It's getting 
close to the 100 kilowatt hours per square meter, which is a 50% reduction. That is actually without the renewables. When you add the renewables on, then it hits a 60% reduction. And the final example I was going to give uh, from the uh, RBA perspective is the uh, Everyman Theatre. This won the Sterling Prize many years ago. And when we went back and analysed it, it actually hit the 2030 challenge and an amazing figure of 186 kilowatt hours per square metre. This is actual energy use. And it's a naturally ventilated building, which has reused um, a lot of the old brick that was actually on the site. Um, so phenomenal performance of this one. And it's a beautiful building as well. So we can, we can actually have beautiful buildings that perform well. And that should be the, the gold standard for the Sterling Prize moving forward. A couple of uh, examples from Europe, uh, just showing this is the best of the, uh, the commercial office in, in, in Europe. So these are um, calculated, but again, they're actually ongoing in terms of POE. But you can see we're getting into that zone of that 2030 um, uh, challenge zone. And then looking at all the data together, we see the top line there is really... Um, the top horizontal line is 150 kilowatt hours per square meter. That's that's really a good modern office. Uh, the 225 is the average. So we see that's where we are. And then we've mapped out uh, quite a few buildings and you might recognize some of your buildings on here. And um, we can see the target we need to get to is 55 kilowatt hours per square meter uh, before we really encourage you and, and want to offsite uh, or offset through offsite renewables. And the enterprise building achieves that in, in general. Uh, so just finishing up, um, just a few takeaways, really. The first thing, really, what can you do uh, after listening to this? And what, what's, the, what's the biggest thing you can do? And it really is, is to assist your existing clients with carrying out post occupancy evaluation. And it really is a very good way co to connect back to your clients. Uh, and actually, if you're a client, then actually you should phone your design team as well. And really, it's analysing the data. And it's amazing. Um, there's some research uh, been done that really up to 20% energy saving could be done just by actually tuning up the building. You've also got to then think about target net zero whole life carbon. That's what's the coming out in the future and really prioritize deep retrofit buildings. Just think about um, how we can reimagine existing buildings rather than actually sort of uh, demolishing. We could target a decade, non, uh, a decade rated for non-domestic buildings and really targeting passive ice performance for domestic buildings. Moving on to water, again, target that 40%, as we said, in the 2030 challenge. Uh, that's a kind of reasonable uh, balance point uh, uh, before you need to get into grey water recycling. Uh, target the well building standard or equivalent, really kind of key issues there. And SIBC TM59 is the new guide, uh, I think, on that in terms of overheating in 52 as well. Um, and finally, a couple of things is really target significantly enhanced biodiversity and green cover. And finally, it's a plea, really, if you're keen on this one, sign up and deliver to the 2030 challenge. Thanks very much. Hi, thank you, Gary. That was really expansive and also makes actions very clear. Um, I'm Michelle Lucarelli. I'm Technical Content Quality Assurance Manager at NBS. And here we're going to follow on with a brief summary of NBS's approach to sustainability and how NBS Chorus can help with the delivery of sustainable outcomes. Firstly, we'll just set out a simple definition around sustainability to make sure we all have a common view. If we agree that sustainability should consider environmental, social and economic factors, we can then look at how NBS tackles these. Typically, NBS content focuses on environmental and ecological considerations appropriate for carbon focus, but also addresses social aspects such as accessibility and user comfort, given that economic concerns usually take care of themselves. We don't determine what is or isn't green, as each project has its own determinants. Instead, we offer guidance and resources to aid decision making and the structure to carry and evolve resultant expectations through the project timeline and, for example, where BIM is adopted into occupation and beyond. Editable template clauses in MBS Chorus offer users the means to set out sustainability requirements tailored to meet individual scenarios applicable to project management, whole building project requirements building fabric, services installations, civil engineering and landscape provision. To help, we offer technical guidance for users. 
Loose guidance covers relevant regulatory publications, standards, codes of practice, and other references and resources, including websites or trade body information, as well as signposting. Guidance is offered at general, clause, or item, or row level within our content. Moving on to more detail, we'll set out the kind of coverage in MVS Chorus that can help with delivering sustainable outcomes for projects. Recapping what Gary has covered, the RIBA plan of work via the RIBA Sustainable Outcomes Guide effectively sets sustainability targets that relate to specific UN sustainable development goals as shown here. As mentioned by Gary, the guide looks for targets to be met by 2030 for new and refurbished buildings and by 2050 for the majority of existing buildings. Again, recapping Gary's presentation, the RIBA targets set for the eight key sustainable outcome categories are net zero operational carbon emissions, net zero embodied carbon dioxide, sustainable water cycle, sustainable connectivity and transport, sustainable land use and ecology, good health and well-being, sustainable communities and social value, and sustainable life cycle cost, with the first two carbon targets effectively delivering whole life carbon emissions. MBS Chorus can help with the delivery of these sustainability targets by allowing for granularity and setting project requirements from inception through to completion. By capturing specification decisions throughout the project timeline, there is also the potential to follow through into facilities management and in-use appraisals to ensure the desired outcomes are achieved. Within the project management specification set in Chorus, strategic and high-level performance requirements can be set, informing the ongoing development of the design and specification. Performances typically associated with sustainability include design quality, durability, functional properties and life cycle, and also cover performance compliance, which is very important, and project context. In greater detail, additional performance requirements can be set with more granularity. This also includes things like air tightness performance, environmental scheme performance, habitat creation and protection, sustainability performance wholesale, including accessibility and inclusivity. I'll now show some clips of performance content from the chorus tool here to show the editable clauses to the left and the guidance to the right. Here there are examples for performance policy for site works covering CO2, water consumption, pollution, etc. Functional properties covering durability, thermal design, energy use, waste and recycling, etc. This one covers life cycle requirements. And here's cover for performance compliance and project context. And finally, an example covering environmental scheme performance requirements, in this instance with guidance on BRIAM. If we've looked at how the RIBA targets might be covered in high level performance in the chorus project management set, we can also look at what these look like at a more detailed level further on in the spec. In chorus, this is currently defined as systems and products, where elements such as walls, roofs, or floors are made up of groups of systems, and systems are made up of groups of products. So we'll now run through the targets looking at examples of how they might be tackled in NBS chorus system and product clauses. Taking them in order, net zero operational carbon emissions, seen as perhaps the most fundamental of targets where there is carbon-based energy use. Requirements are set for the performance of the building fabric to minimize heat losses or gains when in use. These can be set at elemental level for floors, roofs, walls, windows, door sets, etc. Minimizing energy use informs choice of methodologies and plant for heating, cooling, and ventilation. Maintenance factors and occupant engagement must also be considered to optimize equipment performance under a range of real world variables, including supply security and occupant understandings regarding controls and net benefits. 
technologies that optimize on-site renewable energy can be incorporated into the specification, fulfilling strategic requirements set earlier in the project development. Here, for example, ground source heat pumps and building or operational and maintenance manual content can be covered also. Net zero embodied energy and CO2. Environmental targets can be set using assessment tools such as BRIAM or be set independently. Illustrated here is protection of flora and fauna during works under deconstruction. Responsible sourcing is covered where recognized validated schemes exist. Here looking at timber sourcing. Durability can also be considered. This example is for cold roof covering. Additionally, MBS Chorus allows system and product performances to be set covering a range of sustainable attributes, or can simply require that supplier manufacture is by a company with an independently certified environmental assessment scheme, such as ISO 14001. This is shown here for Dorset products. Continuing with embodied energy, products and materials should be selected to minimize their carbon footprint. However, specifiers will need to undertake research to verify embodied energy claims, ideally using validated schemes such as environmental product declarations to EN 15804 and including transportation to site and end of life options. They will need to determine whether whole life considerations such as durability, maintenance and in use energy reductions make a given product an appropriate choice. MBS chorus guidance may suggest options such as materials alternatives. Here, natural materials, soil, stone, timber, over concrete. Other guidance might note consideration of materials or products that are manufactured in country of use. Here, PV panels. And other content may combine low carbon construction techniques with locally sourced materials. At this point, I'll mention MBS Source. Source is our newly launched manufacturer product platform. We started a program of work to enhance this content and standardize it further. With respect to sustainability, we will be asking all manufacturers to provide information around embodied carbon, recycled content, recyclability, and any third party certification relevant to sustainability. Over and above this general information, we'll also be asking manufacturers to provide information specific to their type of product. This could include information such as VOC emissions, energy efficiency class, or where a product is manufactured. Sustainable water cycle. MBS Chorus can support the specification of systems and products which help manage water, whether main supplied, gray cycled, or from weather events. Examples include RAS approved products helping to reduce water waste from misuse or leak detection systems. And sustainable urban drainage is covered. This may be a feature that tackles flood mitigation and supports ecosystems or is part of harvesting or recycling of water. Typically, planning and spatial design are not directly addressed in NBS specification content. This is normally addressed in planning policy, strategy, modeling and drawings, transport plans, network strategies, site selection, etc., are dealt with elsewhere. MBS Chorus does, however, offer the means to specify the infrastructure and systems that deliver these strategies. So, for example, cycle parking facilities, car charging points, or also digital infrastructure. Sustainable land use and biodiversity. Strategic decisions on land use and ecology, such as building reuse, brownfield site selection, mixed use, density, land allocation, again sit outside MBS Chorus content. What is available is guidance which helps support these goals. This may include control of pollution impacts during construction as part of project management content, while other systems and products in NBS Chorus can help to promote ecosystems, whether part of the building fabric, a landscape feature, or an ecological aid. 
continuing good health and well-being. Looking at an example showing the hierarchy of detail, accessibility or inclusive design can also be tackled strategically in project management clauses, shown here, denoted by the PM. But then detail can be set at system level, here denoted by the SF. And in there, we can select an appropriate system performance, inclusive design. We then can go on to product level using MBS guidance as well. For example, referencing BS8 300. So here we have a product that has its own performance level set. And the guidance is helping throughout all these stages to guide the specified. Sustainable communities and social value. As mentioned, certain RIBA sustainable outcome guide targets relating to planning and spatial design criteria sit outside MBS specification reach. At present, Chorus can help by providing template clauses that support community and social equality improvements using landscape, open spaces and amenities, or accessible features and social responsibility schemes. Illustrations here include playground provision, wetlands, natural amenity improvement, or perhaps a considerate constructor scheme. Sustainable life cycle cost. Currently, NBS Chorus has limited cover for in-use monitoring. However, requirements can be set in project management sections looking at performance and performance compliance. This sums up the RIBA sustainable outcomes targets. So in summary, we can see that Chorus can support sustainable outcomes specification using project management clauses to set high level performance requirements and system and product clauses to define prescriptive requirements, tailoring the clauses to meet the needs of the project. Looking forward on improving the specification tool offering, MBS Chorus content is continually evolving, informed by research, user feedback, and industry drivers. For example, we're currently improving our modular construction content that in turn addresses waste, build quality, and durability. This can help with, say, delivering passive house standard constructions on a wider scale. Feedback and insight is vital to us to grow our content and make it relevant for users. And for this reason, we actively seek suggestions for content development from you as users and from industry. Please contact the technical content team with development ideas and comment via the details at the end of the webinar. The climate change emergency gives urgency to the uptake of actions that can mitigate negative climate impacts. At MBS, we're hopeful that with dialogue and exchange between practitioners, the wider construction industry and ourselves, we can help to accelerate these actions. Okay, thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Gary. So yeah, two fantastic presentations uh, there. I'm just gonna go through some questions now. I think we'll start with you, Gary, if that's all right. Uh, there's one here about uh, renewable energy. So like, I've been hearing about renewable energy all, all my life because it's the right thing to do, but will we hit the point where it's actually more efficient to generate energy renewably than uh, from traditional, traditional ways? Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, yeah, interesting question. Um, I I think I think we're there. I think we're past that point. I think that the um, if you look at uh, offshore wind generators or wind generators generally, I think that their um, their uh, life cycle. And I think there's a lot of debate on this. Uh, I'm sure there's um, many views, different views, but the data I've seen really is is um, that is the most economical way to generate electricity uh, com compared to anything. Um, and also its life cycle, it's, it does generate uh, more energy. So in terms of this kind of whole life embodied um, um, sort of calculation, um, that's the thing, even though it's cost quite a lot of money to create and there's a lot of carbon that goes into it, there's a lot of maintenance, uh, you've got to look at all that in the round and then on, on the face of it, that's it. That, that for me, that is the, uh, that's part of our future. But it shouldn't, I think the thing is with renewables, it isn't just about one thing. It's about a whole bundle and batching. Uh, we need lots of different things. Uh, so coming back onto PV, again, lots of my, uh, my colleagues, uh, deep green colleagues, are really concerned about uh, the rush to PV 
Uh, now, what I'd say is that the, um, the calculations, again, I've seen in terms of a body carbon of PV, really it's about 10 years uh, payback in terms of carbon, maybe slightly less now in terms of the cost. So I, I would urge people to do that. But it's, it, that work only works when you buy really efficient um, PVs, you know, 20% plus efficiency. You've got to buy it from a reputable source who guarantee and warranty the output output over its its lifespan 25 to 50 years and then you've got to place them in sensible uh, poaches which are not overshadowed so the rush to can apply pv to everything if you don't follow those principles then yeah i think you could you could actually create a problem for our own making so i think on that two things i think we can as long as we diversify and then storage is the, is the last critical thing so i think we're probably not quite there yet with storage um, but uh, I think I think we've passed the point where renewables is the future uh, and we've got to uh, really kind of look at storage issues. Yeah, I know I've, I followed some accounts on Twitter and it gives this sort of daily energy breakdown in terms of how much is coal, how much is solar, how much is wind in the UK. And it, it, it's every year it seems to go up as a percentage and seeing countries like Denmark with the wind uh, energy generation, it's uh, certainly exciting yeah. time on the renewables yes. front. Yes, uh, exactly. Who, yes. In your presentation, you talked about like the clients got to lead a bit as well. And are you seeing the UK government departments like education, uh, health, r really pushing on the sort of green agenda nowadays? Um, I, I'd love to say yes. And I think if there's any um, government people listening to this um, uh, that they're they're not happy with what I'm going to say next, then please get in contact with me. Um, but um, I think the will is there, and I think that the policies uh, are 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 there. I think they're coming through. Um, I think the the main thing is that we need the uh, MHCLG to um, really enforce PARTEL and we need it linked to the carbon reduction targets. So I'm, I'm really urging, the RBA is really urging the, the, um, the government to sign up to the 2030 challenge effectively. Um, but um, so I think there's some good examples, but I think there's a lot uh, more to do. So uh, I think the departments need to lead by, by uh, you know, uh, show leadership. And, uh, and I think it's not bad, but I think that we need all the departments to say, right, let's go for net zero carbon now. That's what I'm really urging people to do. Yeah. Now, now, on the face of it, the embodied carbon metric looks quite simple. So a uh, unit of energy per kilogram or meter squared or what have you. But the complexity behind it in terms of has it been recycled? Has it been generated from renewable source? Where has it been quarried to site? How has it been transported, et cetera, et cetera? How, what's the sort of best sort of gold standard measurement uh, standards behind embodied carbon? Right. So, yeah, the, this again, another tricky question, this one. So uh, what I'd say is the um, um, the operational targets uh, have been developed over you know, 20, 30 years and a lot of research has been gone into that. The embodied side of thing um, hasn't really had the same attention over the, the same period. Um, so I'd say where we are now is and this is what we've defined in the RAB uh, Sustainable Outcomes, the 2030 Challenge, which aligns with LETI and UKGBC, is we've got to use, all use the same definitions. So RICs um, have created, our RSEs have created um, a defined approach to how do you uh, define embodied carbon and, and how you measure it. So we've all got to use the same uh, you know, terminology. The, the RICs has actually worked around the world as well, so it's now an international standard. Um, and that's it. That's really what we've got to work to. Now, the problem is, is the tools we use, uh, for instance, one click um, doesn't um, measure everything. Um, so I think this is a, there's a working group uh, happening just now this year where we're trying to work with the developers. Uh, and again, any developers on this line, please contact me. Um, but really, it's a key that we need to make sure that we don't end up with a, um, a performance gap in embodied carbon. We need to make sure we all measure the same things. Um, the information is there in parts. I think Germany and Europe um, uh, have got around about so 3,000 products that are ready, very detailed um, analysis of their embodied carbon. But we need to spread that out. But we can only do this by saying, if we all, if you sign up to the 2030 challenge and, and the London plan asks for a whole life cycle uh, analysis of products, once you ask for that, then the data will come through from our supply chain. And is, do you know, is there a third party certification scheme which sort of verifies manufacturer claims when it comes to embodied carbon? Ah, yes. Okay. So I think that's where the, it's the EPDs in, uh, in Europe. 
that's the that's the one that um, there's about three thousand products and then they are, they are certified yeah. uh, but um, I think this is where um, the likes of BRE uh, there's there's some work being done on that but yeah we need to expand that quite quickly but I think it's just that thing where it's so complicated um, there needs to be a need uh, and almost a, a defined thing if if everybody on this line the 500 people who are listening to this if we all say right demand that we want to see the embodied carbon uh, on the data sheet of any product you're specifying, um, then I think you know through um, through that power, I think we can change we change we can change our supply chain quite quickly. Yeah, I guess it's like marketing when you go and do shopping at the supermarket, and you just expect now to have the sugar, the uh, fat, the protein on, on the label, and I think we need to get the same place with the construction yeah. products. That's uh, right. We need one a low... final question. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Sorry. I was just going to say that we need a low carb. We need a low carb setting on our products. Uh, I think when you showed some of the example projects in your presentation there, and I noticed one or two were RIBA award winning projects. Are, are RIBA going to use that as a, any sort of like carrot stick approaches to really sort of push uh, architectural practices to push the sustainability agenda? Yeah, I mean, that, that's our hope. Um, I've got very positive, I mean, I don't actually obviously work for the RBA. I'm just a, a member and uh, I volunteer in terms of my role as chair. Um, but I, I think the RBA are listening and uh, and in terms of actually our uh, work on the uh, the awards criteria, uh, we've uh, revised it a little bit this this year for the 2020. Um, and But it's really, it will align with our 2030 challenge. Uh, that is how we've scoped it out with the RBA, and uh, so I think that I think everybody's got to be prepared for that. And and we made sure we it's, it's really starting off with a soft start. Um, we you know it's a it's a 20% reduction um, for 2020, uh, but really you know we think most practices should be able to achieve that. But we can see there is that there's lots of practices that we can achieve net zero now. Um, so what we're saying is really we're giving people 10 years to really. Um, our peers to kind of catch up and so we're all upskilled but we can't hang about we, we you know the, the key thing there is, is is 2025 for us is that 50 percent reduction that's when we're hoping that the awards will align with the 2030 challenge um so that you know no no building will win an award unless it hits that target um so that's our that's our hope uh and we're we're, we're very kind of, sort of positive that the rba will support us in that Okay, thank you, Gary. Just a, a few questions for Michelle now. I'm just going to start uh, with, with the most important one, actually. We, we did hear a dog bark in the background because obviously we're all presenting from home. What, what's the name of the dog? Bertie. Very nice. And what sort of dog is it? He's a wire-haired fox terrier. Very stubborn. <laughs> okay, back back to the, the proper questions. So, uh, yeah, what, what is the message to construction product manufacturers that want to be specified? How, how can they sort of show this information off that they've got? Well, I suppose it's making as much of their technical data and certification, especially third party verified um, in relation to sustainability available to specifiers um, and making sure that's in, an, a, in a, an accessible and clear format. So yeah, uh, with MBS Source, the platform that we're launching or launched um, we're going to be working with all the manufacturers who subscribe to MBS and hopefully receive this information and make it accessible. Um, our standard data format, that will mean that uh, when specifiers are needing to find out about, say, recycled content or embodied energy or water usage, then they'll have a consistent way of doing it from each manufacturer. Now, you showed a few screenshots of the MBS sort of template content, template clauses, template guidance. Practices will have their own knowledge that they've built up over time. How can they supplement the MBS sort of base content and add their own sort of uh, knowledge in there? Yeah, it's really important, this um, reusing information that you know is valid, uh, but keeping it up to date. Um, the MBS template clauses and technical guidance are the starting point to the specification writing um, and where you can use it as a source. But customers will supplement this with their own knowledge and they create office masters, which can then be reused on future product, pro, sorry, future projects. Uh, the specifiers, yeah. they maintain these as we, NBS, provide alerts 
uh, when the base NVS content changes. Yeah, thank you. And you mentioned, I think Gary mentioned as well, a little bit about Passive House. Uh, can you say a little bit more about MBS and Passive House? Yeah, we've we've had some challenges around covering this in the past, um, partly because it's tended to be smaller scale, um, but it's an area we want to expand on to cover, um, you know, more large scale production and delivery. So we, we want to expand our com our guidance. Uh, but the current NBS content has always allowed construction professionals to specify high requirements in respect to solar heat gain, insulation, air tightness, natural ventilation, and electrical equipment. So there's there's been a lot there that could be used, but we really want to target this better in the future. And you, you often hear about people saying, oh, we write the spec at the last minute on a Friday afternoon and before tender, et cetera, et cetera. How can starting the specification writing process earlier help achieve sustainable outcomes? Well, obviously, we're going to say, you know, start early, um, but it's vital now. And I, actually, it relates to things like the, the, the golden thread. Um, chorus can allow whole building performance to be specified, and then that can lead to listing the specific building systems which can be described in terms of their overall performance and then the products that can meet that performance. Verification and testing can also be specified, but the main thing is that if someone is thinking of substituting, now that could be substitution of a product, but it goes all the way up through system element performance requirement, you need to know where those ideas have come from, where they started. So that specification early on, make sure everyone knows what they're working to. So if you don't specify this well at that point, then the value engineering will often come back just round to looking at capital cost only, and not the bigger picture of what value really means. Yeah, thank, thank you, Michelle. An important point uh, to finish on. Okay, I think that was a fantastic uh, couple of sets of presentations and Q&A. Just a little bit of wrap up from myself. Uh, if you want to download the RIBA plan of work, I think the best thing is just go to Google and search for uh, RIBA plan of work. And that's going to take you straight to architecture.com. And uh, as mentioned by Gary and also Dale in last uh, week's presentation, free download of the template, of the overview and of the little Excel toolbox with the uh, design responsibility matrix, etc. If you want to download the sustainable outcomes guide, again, just just search for it, uh, RIBA sustainable outcomes guide, and it, it'll be top of the, the the search result there. So again, straight through to architecture.com. It's the same experience. You click the view downloads, and it's there as a a free free download. A fantastic publication. A uh, tiny bit just to finish on on NBS. Uh, NBS we've got solutions for specifiers, architects, engineers, and also solutions for building product manufacturers. So NBS Chorus, NBS Source. All of Michelle's screenshots today were taken from NBS Chorus. So this is our online specification product. You go into a project here, and I've just got two sample specs set up. This one looking at whole building specifications. And you can see that we've got sections for things like uh, the sort of environmental information where you, you want to maybe look at things like surveys and initial reports. And then another section here, which looks at whole project performance requirements, things like the overall daylighting and uh, durability and environmental schemes, etc., with guidance and links to standards on the, the, the right hand side. Once you've sort of done your architectural concept, you're going more into the sort of end of the concept stage, the, the, the stage three, you can start adding your building systems. So if we just uh, jump out here and go to the example technical spec, and I just very quickly add uh, two systems. So if I wanted combined heat and power, search for CHP there, and you can just drop that straight into the spec. Uh, maybe what I do, I'll search for a curtain wall system as well. Uh, if you weren't sure what type of curtain wall, you read the guidance on the right-hand side, drop it into the job, and then what you see here is the, 
the template specification content and guidance allowing you to develop this through the timeline. So you can write a description. If you click in any of these prompts, the drop down values allow you to add those clauses. So if you want to specify things like uh, the thermal performance, the solar energy transmittance, durability, you can invoke uh, those clauses and they get added to the spec. You've got all the different products, which uh, we've talked about today. And then finally things like, well, what do you want at the end of the, 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 the job as well? Like testing the performance, a key one. But also for some big systems like this, planning for like the, the recycling and the dismantling at the end of the, 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 the actual use of the building as well. NBS source, source.mbs.com is the manufacturer platform and uh, we're running out of time a little bit, but you can search for manufacturers. So if you know the manufacturer's name, just sort of click on it. You can also, if you know a, a particular product reference, I jump straight to that as well. So there's a particular product from Kingspan Insulation, all classified by Uniclass. And you can see some of the things that uh, uh, Michelle mentioned, such as the sort of environmental uh, schemes at a manufacturer level, and then going down to things like responsible sourcing and recycle content, uh, third party certification, BBA certificates, etc. More information, go to the mbs.com, the case studies page, uh, I'd recommend, especially these first two, Maber Architects, David Miller Architects. And then please uh, make it a weekly weekly event uh, coming to the MBS webinar. So there's this sustainability one we've had today, fire safety next week, information exchanges, specification development, health and safety. And uh, we might do a few more as well on topics like inclusive design, procurement, uh, et cetera, as well. So thank you all for listening today. So one last big thank you to Gary, big thank you to Michelle. Uh, please pop your comments, your questions in, uh, visit architecture.com, the mbs.com. Uh, you can always email us, you can give us a ring. And uh, yeah, I hope everybody's uh, working from home successfully and uh, uh, doing okay in the, the, the lockdown. Thank you all for listening. Uh, take care, everybody. Bye-bye.